Today we're doing a detailed comparison of the benefits and drawbacks of air-cooled, oil-cooled and water-cooled engines. So first let's answer the questions, why do engines even need cooling? Well, there's a very simple way to answer that question. Get your hands and rub them together. Feeling the heat? Well, that heat is a consequence of friction, and there's plenty of friction happening inside the engine. But by far the largest source of friction inside the engine, up to about 40% of the total friction, is the sliding of the piston rings against the cylinder bore. Now, the faster you rub your palms together, the more friction and heat you generate. And the same thing happens to the engine. The higher the RPM, the faster the piston rings travel against the cylinder bore, and the more passes they complete in a single minute. And the more they do this, the more heat they generate. Now, if this heat is left uncontrolled, it's of course going to lead to the engine overheating, which is eventually going to cause it to melt, which is obviously going to distort the parts of the engine, leading to catastrophic engine failure. So how do we control all of this heat? Well, the earliest and simplest answer is to use the air that's already available everywhere outside the engine. This means that air-cooled engines don't need any additional cooling equipment like liquids or liquid containers or hoses or whatever. Air-cooled engines cool themselves simply by being in contact with the surrounding air and transferring their heat onto this air. You can easily recognize air-cooled engines by the increased number of fins on their cylinder heads and sometimes even on other parts of the engine as well. These fins serve the purpose of increasing the outer surface area of the engine over which air can pass and heat exchange can occur. In other words, by increasing the outer surface area, we increase the space over which heat can be distributed and dissipated. And that's the basics of air cooling. Obviously, this makes air-cooled engines dead simple. And this has the potential to make them pretty lightweight and their maintenance very easy uh, and their production costs low. But there's a price to be paid for the simplicity. Uh, and the first item on that price list is uneven cooling. If we imagine an air-cooled engine in the stream of air, we can see that the front part of the engine does indeed get cooled. But the back part of the engine, which isn't in direct contact with the oncoming air, doesn't get cooled so well. Another major issue is that cooling will be greatly reduced when the engine is stationary. This means that air-cooled engines are more susceptible to overheating if they get stuck in slow-moving traffic. Now, this issue can be to an extent addressed by the installation of fans, but these do of course increase the complexity and production costs and they also create a parasitic load on the engine. But the main issue with air-cooled engines is that they're inherently limited in their cooling capacity because obviously we're limited uh, in the extent to which we can increase the outer surface area of the engine with fins. And this limited cooling capacity is one of the main reasons why air-cooled engines typically need to run richer than the liquid-cooled ones. Now, running rich refers to the air-fuel ratio inside the engine at 14.7 units of air mass to one unit of fuel mass, the engine is said to be running at a stoichiometric air-fuel ratio. In theory, at least at this air-fuel ratio, all the air and fuel inside the cylinder are consumed or burned during the combustion process, leaving no excess air or fuel left inside the cylinder. Now, if we add more fuel and transform the air fuel ratio to, let's say, 13 to 1, we're said to be running rich. Uh, 12 to 1, uh, 11 to 1, even 10 to 1. All of these air fuel ratios are possible inside the engine, depending on the engine. But all of these are rich air fuel ratios. And in theory, we're going to have excess fuel in the cylinder at these air fuel ratios. At air fuel ratios higher than 14.7 to 1, for example, 15 to 1, 16 to 1, 17 to 1, even 20 to 1, we're said to be running lean. In theory, there's going to be excess air inside the cylinder at these air fuel ratios. Now, the more fuel we introduce into the cylinder, the cooler the engine is going to run. This occurs because when fuel is introduced into the cylinder, it transforms from liquid fuel into fuel vapor. But for this to occur, energy is needed, and that energy is heat. So as fuel vaporizes, it absorbs a relatively large amount of heat from its surroundings, and this then reduces cylinder temperatures. This is known as evaporative cooling, and it's the same basic principle behind sweating. When we're hot, our bodies sweat, and this cools you down because heat energy is required to evaporate the sweat off of our skin. And that heat energy is the excess heat already present inside our bodies. So as you sweat, body heat is expelled in order to evaporate the sweat, and this cools you down. 
Now, air-cooled engines rely on running richer than liquid-cooled engines to ensure that the engine doesn't overheat even when outside temperatures are high and the vehicle is stationary. But running richer than required not only reduces power potential, it also can dramatically increase hydrocarbon emissions, which is one of the reasons why air-cooled engines are no longer present in cars. Another factor which contributes to increased emissions is that air-cooled engines typically require more time to reach optimal operating temperature. This is because their cooling system is always on. The fins are always there and the air is always around the engine. You cannot turn off any of these things. And this is why air-cooled engines typically run cold longer after startup, which also increases hydrocarbon emissions. So air cooling obviously has its limits, but engineers soon realized that they could overcome these limits by leveraging a liquid that's already present inside the engine. Now the line between air cooled and oil cooled engines can be blurry, and this is because all oil cooled engines are also air cooled, and on almost all oil cooled engines you will find the same air cooling fins that you can find on engines that are only air cooled. The other reason is that many air cooled engines like the Volkswagen, Porsche, Flat 4s and Flat 6s also feature a oil core on them, so some people refer to them as being oil cooled rather than air cooled. But a clear distinction can be made, and an engine is classified as oil cooled not by the presence of an oil cooler, but by the fact that a part of the oil is specifically circulated through dedicated channels with the clear intent of cooling rather than lubricating the engine. A telltale sign of an oil-cooled engine will be increased oil capacity. Now, one of the most widely known examples of oil-cooled engines has been manufactured by Suzuki for many years, and these are engines featuring their SACS or Suzuki Advanced Cooling System. This system was present on GSX-R as well as GSF, uh, Bandit, uh, DR, and other Suzuki motorcycles. The increased oil capacity which reveals their oil-cooled nature is very obvious on these machines. For example, a GSX R750 from the late 80s needs 4.7 liters of oil for an oil change. In comparison to this, an air-cooled only or a water-cooled 750cc motorcycle carries noticeably less oil. Now, the oil pump of the SAC system has a dual-chamber, dual-rotor design. One side of the oil pump circulates oil at a high pressure to ensure the lubrication of engine internals and the prevention of metal-to-metal -metal contact, but the other side of the oil pump circulates oil at a low pressure but at high volumes to ensure optimal cooling. Now, the cooling side has dedicated channels which flow in the vicinity of the combustion chamber, the main source of engine heat, and they cool it by circulating large volumes of oil quickly all around the combustion chamber. Now, the cooling channels also feature small ridges which act as boundary layer breakers. They prevent a zero-velocity boundary layer from forming directly on the surface of the cooling channel and reducing the efficiency of the heat exchange. After this, the oil circulates through an oil cooler, which is essentially a radiator. And a radiator is another device that relies on increased surface area to maximize heat exchange with the air passing through and over it. Now, the oil is distributed to multiple thin tubes that go through the radiator, and these tubes have an extremely large number of very small fins attached to them. Now, the oil transfers its heat away to the tubes, and the tubes transfer it to the fins, and then the fins are cooled by the air. In this respect, you can say that all engines are ultimately air-cooled and that the liquid is only used to store the heat and transport it away from the source to the radiator. And then the radiator can be ideally suited in the stream of air. And the radiator also isn't limited in surface area increasing via fins in the sense that the engine itself is, leading to even cooling across the entire surface of the radiator. So oil cooling has the advantage of being able to circulate all around the combustion chamber, take heat away right from the source and evenly cool all parts of the engine. The downside is the presence of an oil cooler which increases complexity and production costs, but most air-cooled only engines also have an oil cooler, so the only real disadvantage is increased servicing costs due to increased oil capacity. But there's another drawback to oil cooling, and it has to do with the heat capacity of engine oil. Now, unused engine oil has an average heat capacity of around 2 kilojoules per Kelvin. This means that it can absorb 2 kilojoules of energy in the form of heat before its temperature increases by 1 Kelvin. 
Water, on the other hand, has a heat capacity of 4.18 kilojoules per Kelvin, which means that water can absorb twice the amount of heat before its temperature starts increasing, making water the ideal solution for cooling engines if you plan to make your engines generate a lot of heat. And that's exactly what modern engines are doing. Modern engines tend to run close to the stoichiometric air fuel ratio in many conditions in order to increase efficiency and reduce fuel consumption. But the closer we are to the stoichiometric ratio, the higher the heat generated by combustion. Also, forced induction in the form of turbocharging or supercharging is present on many modern engines and that too increases heat. Uh, modern engines, especially those high performance ones uh, on motorcycles, tend to rev very, very high and that's another source of increased heat. Uh, and all of this together with ever increasing demands for power uh, efficiency and reduced emissions tends to make modern engines run very hot and in most cases oil simply isn't adequate to absorb all this heat generated by the engine and this is where water cooling steps in Oil now has only a secondary minor role in cooling the engine and the main task of cooling belongs to water. Water circulates through dedicated channels all around the engine block and the cylinder head, meaning that it absorbs heat quickly and efficiently from all around the engine and cools the engine evenly. Now, water alone doesn't circulate through the engine. It's actually a mixture of water and antifreeze. As the name suggests, antifreeze prevents the water from freezing. When water turns into ice, it expands. So if water were to freeze inside an engine block, it would likely crack the engine block. Antifreeze also serves as a rust inhibitor and prevents corrosion, which would occur inside the engine if water alone was used in the cooling system. To ensure proper circulation, a water pump is also necessary, and it's usually driven by the engine via a belt. Although in more recent vehicles, the water pump can also be electronic, which reduces the parasitic load on the engine. As in the case of oil cooling, water is passed through a radiator, and the radiator dissipates the heat absorbed from the engine into the surrounding air. Another key component of water cooling is the thermostat, and it ensures that water doesn't circulate through the radiator until the engine reaches optimal operating temperature. This reduces emissions and engine wear by dramatically reducing the time it takes the engine to reach operating temperature. So water cooling is by far the most efficient and capable engine cooling system and this is why modern engines have it. But the price to be paid for it is increased production costs, increased maintenance and increased number of parts required for water cooling to operate. And there you have it, the advantages and drawbacks of different engine cooling systems. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the d 4 engine.